It's Wednesday, March 9th, and the time for your body this to be morning news update. Government is again exploring the possibility of capping the value added tax collected on fuel. Word of this from Minister in the Ministry of Finance, Ryan Strong, who revealed that those details will be outlined in next week's budget. He said that a promised ease in taxes on freight is also on the cards, but fears that with further increases expected to hit the global market, the savings for consumers may be limited. As it relates to the fuel tax itself, as we had indicated um, previously, the, we had indicated that we would review the VAT that was being applied to 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 the entire system and determine at what level we will cap the VAT that we collect on that and therefore it is not the fuel tax but the actual, the, the actual tax collection of fuel generally speaking right. in relation to that and therefore as I said you will hear something on that specifically on Monday in relation to in, in, in relation to the, to the revenue cap and in relation to some taxi and public service vehicle operators are urging government to put measures in place to help them cope with rising fuel prices. In fact, they suggested that government could remove the annual registration fee imposed on members of the sector. In 2018, government abolished the road tax for private and commercial vehicles and replaced it with a fuel tax. However, owners of commercial vehicles were made to pay an annual registration fee. Here is what some had to say about the impact of fuel increases. It's impacting pretty hard. This is for a while now, not only now, um, we are paying road tax. At the government place in the point we have to pay road tax every year and still we're paying for it in the gas so it's a fact that it's double and uh up to this morning went in the pump normally it would fill up around it would charge me around 180 this morning went to 205. it has been affecting me for a while and now the little increase would, it, would affect you more because i was telling you earlier we guys we taxi guys still pay road tax which in the other guys don't so, so we end up paying more at the pump still in those, uh, in, in a sense, than those guys because we still pay road tax. What have you been doing to try to mitigate the impact? But in a try, I in a job that I can't do it as, but I got to put it in. Cause I'm a taxi guy, so I got to work. So then, then no way to try to mitigate it to impact it. You got to, I got to work, so I got to put it in. So, do, do you see anything that the government could do then to help? Well, it can be done at a national level. Well, they could try to ease the taxi, man. Because, you know, fears haven't, haven't gone up since 2008 on the island. So. So and since then, gas have gone up real enough times. What the government will do, you will, you will probably um, encourage the business sector to see how they could cut back on the prices that serve to help the, um, help the economy. So that's when it really was out. But it was very difficult to think because when prices increase, the, the um, producer or the business people can pass it on more slightly to the, um, to the consumer. But if, if we want to look for the overall development of the country, the, um, those business people will go trade hard enough to mitigate their prices so that not pass it on to the consumers. For Queen Elizabeth Hospital's ophthalmology department will this week begin clearing the backlog of glaucoma surgeries that have accumulated as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Word of this from Dr. Don Grosner, as the department observes World Glaucoma Week from March 7th to 11th. Dr. Grosner told Barbados today that some 15 to 20 glaucoma surgeries will be conducted at the QEH to begin the process of shortening the existing list of approximately 70 persons awaiting surgery. Okay, we're looking to jump start this process of clearing the backlog of specifically glaucoma surgery cases, which is a bit different from the cataract surgery group, a bit smaller group, but um, really important because people with glaucoma are in danger of losing their sight permanently. So time is of the essence when we're dealing with glaucoma surgery. Um, we know that we, we have always had challenges in the past, and you've heard that you know, discussed in other, air, other fora, but the pandemic really added significantly, significantly to that, and it led to some delays with our glaucoma surgeries. So we're hoping to use the occasion of World Glaucoma Week to kickstart the process. Normally, I would operate on about four to six glaucoma patients every week. 
Um, and that is because I have, we have one operating theater that uh, they assign to me. One operating theater day every other week, actually. So it's four to six patients every other week because of the limitations of our large department. We have 10 consultants, but only five operating days. So we each basically alternate. Um, and, you know, that's about eight to 12 patients, you know, in a, in a month, right? Um, I get about three patients for surgery every week. So it's very hard to keep up with that, particularly then if you add the delays that the pandemic added as well. Dr. Grosner, who is the chair of the organizing committee, said emergency eye surgeries will also be facilitated this week once cases arise. What we want to do this week is capitalize on the opportunity for in Glaucoma Week. The other consultants have all agreed to give me a day of their time during this week so that we can all make a, you know, a sort of a whole department effort um, towards starting to get that backlog down. Now, we, we don't interrupt the what we were going to operate on four or five days this week because there's another operating list which is equally important, if not more so, the retinal list, which is where diabetic patients who are at risk of losing their vision and emergency patients often will have their surgery. So we decided we would leave that intact because those are also blending problems as well and we would do the other four days. There's regional and international news after this short break. Hi, I'm Onika. I am a mother. I'm a daughter and I'm a wine educator. When vaccines first came on the scene last year, I was really apprehensive about getting vaccinated. I was worried about taking a drug that I felt was experimental. So at first, I really wasn't about it. I decided to get vaccinated. I had to acknowledge the fact that I am asthmatic and my son is also asthmatic. I have a career in wine. We depend on our senses and I decided that I did not want to risk it for being afraid of taking a vaccine. Coronavirus has affected everyone around the globe. And keeping this in mind, make sure that your decision is not a selfish one and that you're thinking of the benefits of the whole. Let's roll up our sleeves and get back to living. To developments in the region, the Antigua and Barbuda cabinet is expected to consider a series of changes to the island's COVID-19 protocols, including whether to make the wearing of masks optional. More from ABS News. Health Minister Honorable Sir Malvin Joseph outlined some of the other recommendations. Uh, we are looking at uh, recommendations uh, that will have an impact on the entertainment industry, on the schools, um, impact on the churches, the whole picture, we are looking at the entire picture of how we can um, create a new normal based on the developments which are positive. The fact is we have an average of two cases uh, per day and, and we anticipate that even that number will decline further. The WHO is recommending that um, the wearing of face masks um, can be something that um, countries can consider lifting the restriction for outdoor, um, the use of, of, of face masks outdoor. And that's something that I'm still deliberating on and making, um, you know, reading the science on it and um, a recommendation will be made. But um, I can't tell you right now what my recommendation to cabinet will be. While additional protocols will be eased and others maintained, there was this note of caution from the chief medical officer. The pandemic is not yet over, she says, and the price of the increased freedoms will be constant vigilance. The recommendations that I would want to make as well would it be not only for the lifting of the restrictions, but measures that need to be put in place um, in order for us to continue to monitor and conduct surveillance. Because as we lift restrictions, we in the Ministry of Health have to be more vigilant. And finally, on the international front, President Joe Biden announced on Tuesday a U.S. ban on Russian oil and gas imports over the country's invasion of Ukraine. More from Reuters TV. We're banning all imports of Russian oil and gas and energy. That means Russian oil will no longer be acceptable at U.S. ports and the American people will deal another powerful blow to Putin's war machine. In one of the most powerful and unprecedented moves yet to punish Russia, U.S. President Joe Biden Tuesday announced a ban on Russian oil and other energy imports in retaliation for the invasion of Ukraine. 
But Biden warned it will come at a cost for American drivers already suffering sticker shock at the pump. Since Putin began his military buildup on Ukrainian borders, just since then, the price of the gas at the pump in America went up 75 cents. And with this action, it's going to go up further. Shortly before Biden's remarks, Britain said it would also phase out the import of Russian oil and oil products by the end of 2022, giving businesses time to find alternative sources of supply. Prime Minister Boris Johnson. And we will employ every method that we can, diplomatic, humanitarian and economic, Mr. Speaker, until Vladimir Putin has failed in this disastrous venture and Ukraine is free once more. Russia is the world's top exporter of more than 7 million barrels per day of crude oil and petroleum products. We will not be part of subsidizing Putin's war. Biden acknowledged that many other European partners who are far more dependent on Russian oil can't follow the United States' lead, though he said the U.S. ban came after close consultation with international partners. That's news. But for the very latest, visit us at www.barbadistoday.bb. You can also subscribe to our e-paper, email updates, or like us on Facebook, and sign up for our breaking news alerts via WhatsApp. We're also on Izumi Media in bus terminals, as well as screenplay at supermarkets and gas stations near you. And you can also hear us on Mix 96.9 FM and Capital Media HD 99.3 FM.